Bonjour, Willy Mix. Today I'm gonna show you a little video about mixing and what you can do to put elements into their space because I see a lot of videos about mixing where you process drums and it sounds like and it ends up sounding like like something super obvious which is to be honest not always what we are doing as mixing engineers it's also a lot about subtleties and when you do subtle stuff like this you may wonder if mixing is really useful and actually i would be honest sometimes the rough mix is better left alone but it's not what I'm here to demonstrate today. Today what I wanted to show you is how making choices will impact the way elements fit into a track. And for that, I have a track today that is very stripped down. Acoustic guitar, a few percussion and a bass here that I'm going to demonstrate. And I will show you before and after the processing so you can hear. Okay, so it's not night and day, and that's actually the point of it. Let's first start with the acoustic guitar. I will explain everything what I'm doing. So the point here is not to show what plugins I'm using, because I actually don't really care about plugins. And uh, it's not also the frequency I chose that is important. Is what is important is the mindset. And here, the mix barely started. It's actually what I call a pre-mix, is when I put plugins or hardware on a track to make it fit. So after, I will just have to move the fader applies reverbs and stuff and that to me is more like mixing mixing to me is not like fixing but sometimes that's what you have to do anyway this is the guitar with everything off so yeah it sounds cool a bit muddy so that's why i added this eq i'll look at a little bit to let some space for the bass and use the dynamic eq in the low mids because they are yeah, they are quite busy as you can hear And everything I'm showing here is in solo, which makes absolutely no sense. Every choices that I made here were made in context. But I'm showing it to you here in solo because it's what everyone does on YouTube and otherwise sometimes people complain if you don't. So anyway, here I use the Avalon 737 channel strip from UAD. This video is not sponsored by UAD, by the way, not at all. I use this one because I want to try it. I was curious. I don't have UAD plugins at home. I'm in the studio right now and I want to try it, see how it sounds. I know the hardware. I don't know the plugin that much. It's pretty cool. So I used the uh, mic here um, inputs. So it has a lot of harmonics. It's a very subtle and transparent preamp. It doesn't add a lot in comparison to others, but I will show you how it sounds. I will bypass the EQ and show you how it sounds, just the preamp. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds softer with it. It kind of cleans up the mid-range. It's not something that you would like, for instance, for an acoustic guitar in a more rock or vibey environment. You know, it's something that needs to have a personality. But here, it's a very soft and mellow track. So we want the acoustic guitar to be soft also and not like super, yeah, characterful in a way. And after that, I use the EQ, which sounds like this. That does all, all the heavy lifting. I added a bunch of high end, which sounds very nice on this EQ, by the way. I really like the hardware uh, EQ by Avalon. It's amazing, in my opinion, very sweet and open. I also like to add 2K here. It sounded pretty nice. Cut a little bit of the low. So how did I choose this frequency, for instance? I see a lot of people uh, using an EQ like this and boosting like crazy. 
you know, to find the frequency and cut it after. In my opinion, it works when you need to go quick. Also, when you're on an analog desk, for, for me, it makes more sense. But in the box, when you got the time to think about it, I will advise to do the opposite, actually, to do that. And sweep in context of the song, always in context. In my opinion, it's a nicer way to find the uh, annoying frequency when you're unsure. Of course, the best is to know exactly what you're aiming for, but sometimes you don't and it's fine. And here it's what I did. I cut the low mid and I swept across the frequency and I realized that like 100 or something wasn't really necessary in the mix. So I cut it down. But I also realized that it was kind of a wide cue because I didn't put the high cue here. And I realized that it cut a little bit too much of the body of the acoustic guitar. So I boosted 30, which it makes no sense on acoustic guitar, but here it works. And it's actually what makes it sound still open and bright, but not thin, because otherwise it will sound quite thin, in my opinion. I will show you before and after again. It sounds like just like I cleaned the mid-range more or less. So yeah, that's what I did on this one. Then after I used the Miley Varimu, same. I used the Pulsar plugin usually, but I used this one to try. I know the hardware quite well. I know why I like it and why I don't like it sometimes. And here I think it worked to make it sound softer. Again, it's not something I will use in a characterful mix, but I will let you listen to it to make your own opinion. Again, it should be listened in context, but anyway. <laughs> Also, you make them sound a little bit quieter, so you might think it's better without because it's quieter. I compensated with the Oxide plugin again with the output here. So it's going to sound louder with it again because I compens compensated for the whole chain. But I will switch between input and repro head so you can at least hear what it does without the volume boost. But first, with the volume boost, so you can see, I mean, here. It's obviously louder, let's see, uh, between repro and input. I really like what it has in the lows. I think it's very cool on this acoustic guitar, so with and without quickly again. Yeah, it works. I did something a bit different for the kick drum. In my opinion, what I did is not 100% necessary. I was just trying stuff, but it worked here and it helped to separate it from the bass, actually. So by itself, it doesn't sound amazing, actually. But it sounds like this with and without. So I use the Studer first because it has a, like a massive 4 dB boost in the lows. When you ana analyze the plugin, you can see that. So that's why I used it. Also add saturation a little bit. I use the DBX160. I love the hardware. I actually here got a pair of DBX161 that I really like. And I use just to tickle the needle with it because it's very aggressive. It's very aggressive compression. It's nice. It makes it less soft in a way, but that's what I will need here to make it stand out from the bass, which is like a very low sustain note. And talking about sustain, I use this one, which I absolutely smashed through the input to make it saturate like crazy. I uh, will make you listen with and without, and after I will push the mix knob because I put the mix knob down first. So let's push it to see. Yeah, it's crazy. 
So what I did is in context, I pushed the mix knob a little bit until I found what I liked and I just stopped there. I will show you how it sounds when I push it. It has a little knock in addition to the sustain added, which I really like. I will show you in context here so you can listen to it because yeah, listening in solo, yeah, that's enough. I will make you listen in context now, all right. Yeah, so you hear when I push it to maximum to 100% mix, you can hear it does something to the transient, almost like a flam. And I quite like that, so I pushed it until I heard that flam just enough, but not too much, because if you push it too much, you just destroy with everything. Then after I use a technique that I usually use on the snare, which is cutting the frequencies that are ringing, but boosting it dynamically, right? <laughs> boosting it dynamically. So when the kick hits, it's boosted or at least uh, goes to unity. And when it's not, it goes down. So it's almost like uh, only EQing out the sustain part of the sound. So it sounds like this. Yeah, it sounds a bit duller with it. This also helps to control the kind of frequency there is. Then I use the Culture Vulture. I really love the hardware. I've used to have the mastering uh, edition, the red one, but the black one is also good. I know more the red one though, but I know what it's gonna give me and it's gonna give me a lot of harmonics in the mid range, which is nice on kick drum here, especially in this context. It's gonna fill up the space a little bit and a lot of saturation, obviously. So let's listen to this. Yeah, it makes it a little bit, that gives it some authority in a way. Also, the volume is a little bit quieter again. As I said, I prefer that. It might make me look bad because it might make you feel that the processing is not working well. But I really don't care because in the end, it's not what I'm doing that matters. It's the final song that gets listened to, you know? My ego doesn't matter when I'm mixing a song. It's different though when I'm singing or playing guitar or stuff like that. Anyway, that's what it does. And then I thought, yeah, why not a little bit of attack? It's not my favorite favorite transient designer. It's a little bit too peaky to me. Like the transient's a bit, little bit too sharp most of the time on kick drum in my opinion, but that's the one I have on this computer. So I used it. Yeah, you see what I mean? It's a little bit too uh, yeah, picky, it's a bit too sharp in my opinion, but it works. So with and without again. In context with the guitar, for instance. So you might think, well, the kick drum was fine actually without the processing and that's absolutely true. Like when I recorded the kick drum, I wanted it to sound fine without any processing. That's the whole goal. When you record stuff, you don't want to put plugins on it after. I mean, that's my point of view. I prefer to commit and have a sound that I like and just move the fender, the fader when mixing instead of like thinking, oh, I need to add that 1176 thingy in uh, Pro Tools after. So it sounded fine by itself, but added stuff after in the song, like background vocals and stuff like that. And I realized that the mid range in the kick drum were getting lost anyway, was getting lost anyway with the background vocals, the very low, me, yeah, like low vocal like this. So no point keeping it up. That's why I changed the kick drum. And if you listen carefully, it switches from mid range to a warm low end instead, but not overpowered low end because the overpowered low end is going to come from the bass. Let's, I will let you listen back to it now that you have this in mind. I 
think I can actually push the output a little bit. It's almost as if the kick was going a third lower, you know, from mm, mm, when you really listen to it, it's like mm, mm. you know, bu, 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 like a, a third. You know, it's almost like you're tuning the kick when you're adding processing like that and you're adding harmonics and stuff. And it's something to never forget because it's easy to just throw harmonics, whatever, saturation, plug-in, and adding a ton of aliasing or whatever artifact it's adding, and adding a compressor that's adding a lot of artifact on top of that and, you know, make it a mess and totally change the tonality of the kick drum in a way that you didn't want to because maybe the kick drum was nice in that tonality and what you did just bring it lower, bring it higher in the very dissonant tone you know it's i'm not saying that tuning your kick drum to the song is mandatory i'm not saying that at all but i'm saying that music even if it's percussion or if it's a uh, harmonic instrument it's all about tones you know it's about keys about notes everything is more or less a note and make use of that you know tune down your kick drum with processing with tape, compression, EQ and stuff like that to tune down your kick or to tune it up if you want to make it stand out up, if you want to make it stand out even more, make it up a little bit sharp, you know, stuff like that and vice versa, lower if you want it to be down in the mix and more in the back, you know, everything is, all that creates positioning in the mix. That's actually was the point of the video. Talking about positioning, the tambourine is a nice one. Pretty useless track most of the time, <laughs> you might agree, and something that you won't put plug-in on probably most of the time, or maybe one insert. But here, it sounds like this by itself. So you might think not much of a difference, actually. It was pretty cool dry, because it was punchy, it was coming through, but that's not what I want. Like, the tambourine is not my lead track, not at all. And it's not, the, it's not playing the role of a snare either. So it doesn't need to come forward. And in order to push it back in the mix and keep its brightness still, I use a reverb. Very short reverb with, yeah, nothing fancy. You just choose your reverb, make it short, blend it in. Pre-delay is important if I want to keep a bit of the initial transient. And it sounds like this. Yeah, so in addition to putting it back in the mix, in the back of the mix, it also adds a little bit of sustain. It's very subtle though, so the sustain is probably not the most important part, I would be fair. And then the oxide tape again, because I like how it softened the high end without being too obvious. And it also clips a little bit the peaks, but very slightly. Also very slightly because it's after the reverb and not before. And also because the view is barely moving, so it's actually probably just the compression, uh, the compression saturation I'm using from the plugin, and also the output that I lowered a little bit. So you might think, oh, it's louder without again. Hard to explain, but I like what it did. I like it. So I left it on. In context, you will see how the the tambourine is quite sharp and in the center. And with that processing, it goes back into the mix to let more space for the vocals and other bright elements to shine through in the center. Yeah, because you don't want a sharp tambourine in the center taking all the space, all the high end. You just want it to be at the back, to be an embellishment. You don't want it to be a feature. I mean, that's actually not what I wanted here. Maybe you want a tambourine, lead tambourine song, whatever. Everything's possible. But the other great thing, I mean, not great. The other thing that I did that is 
the most obvious maybe in this uh, video is the shaker. The shaker sounds like this with and without. Much different. Again, I was talking about tuning down and that's more or less what I did here with the shaker again, if you listen to it. To me, it almost sounds like I tuned it down an octave and a third again down. I know it's weird to say that, but if you listen to it, it's almost an octave down in a way, but it doesn't make sense because it doesn't really make a note per se. But the heavy lifting here is done by Native Instruments Dirt. I uh, have to confess, I don't know this plugin. Uh, I know what I wanted to do with this shaker. I wanted to soften it up. And I was scrolling through the list and I saw Dirt. I, would, I had no idea what it was. I was like, let's give it a try. Push the drive, use the tilt and bring back the mix. And I really like what it did. It just had a lot of volume, so I put the mix down. And that's how... I tune it actually to the frequency you might say I wanted. I will show you how it sounds full on. It might be much louder though. Yeah, <laughs> that kind of level difference is usually what you might see in old plugin reviews where they want to show you like, this is before. And now, after. Amazing. You know, that kind of thing. So it's not what I wanted to do here. I don't want to fool myself. So I put it at 7%, just enough to, yeah, tune it down, soften it up and make it almost sound like the shaker is bigger. Actually, it was the illusion I wanted to make because, yeah, I recorded a shaker and it was a mistake to use a shaker that was that high pitched and that thin. I would have maybe loved to have a very big shaker instead and make it sound like a big shaker recorded with a ribbon mic now so that's cool the eq is pretty useless it's just taking a lot of the useless sub that's added with the dirt also to be honest i could live without it like it would probably be fine without that low cut because it's not because you have something happening in the low end in something that you don't need that you have to cut it. Like when you do low cuts and stuff, check in context again. Try to avoid using EQ that level match because when you level match with the low cuts, sometimes it boosts the volume because it's a radical cut in a way. I know some guys even are filtering their mix bugs from 300 to 3K and they test the low cut when they do that or they test the low cut when they use oratones kind of small speakers you can do that too that's pretty cool that's a really nice way to uh, hear what the sh phase shift that it does in the lows how it impacts the rest and always check in context of course so here i could live without it but i realized that it was better when i listened to it in the context i'll probably do it now it might not make a lot of sense but let's see Yeah, you know, it makes not a whole lot of difference. I would be fair. I won't be like, oh, I can hear that small detail at 0, 0 0.1 dB now. It doesn't make a lot of difference, but still, I think it works. It makes almost like if the shaker is a tiny bit brighter and in its own space. And then I wanted to, uh, I usually use a Develock Deluxe by Sun Toys, but I wanted to try this one because I love the Fatso. I love the hardware again. And I think the plugin is quite nice. I wish someone else from UAD and not ASK Note because I don't really like that plugin from ASK Note. But I wish someone else from UAD will do a Fatso because it's an amazing unit, very modern sounding, yet it wants to sound vintage. And I, I like that kind of mix when something modern tries to sound like tape because it gives you all the good things about the modern gear, which is clean, not a lot of noise, kind of tweakable. And also it gives you the good stuff about the vintage tape, which is the saturation, the transformers sometimes, the warmth, which is how it saturates the high frequencies more. 
and all that kind of stuff and also the compression here but it's not very important and to be honest what i did with the fat so here is not very in my opinion not mandatory too but i will let you listen to it and shut my mouth a little bit So it's a bit louder because I used it again to compensate for the whole chain. And what it does is warmth was saturating a little bit more the high, so it made the shaker a bit softer. Tranny, to be honest, doesn't make a lot of difference on the shaker. And the compression is just so it's a very slow attack, fast release, just so it enhances a little bit the initial peaks. So it gives more of a movement. Instead of if I put a fast attack and a slow release, it would be like something like more leveled out, you know, like an LA to it levels out the sound. Here, no, I wanted it to have more attack instead. I could use a transient designer, but as I said, this transient designer that I have here is a bit too sharp. And this is a bit softer in a way. It's a bit more controlled, a bit more what I like. Okay, 103 dB. I like how it makes it almost like it's sticky. You know, it's got... It's the back of the shaker, the back movement of the shaker is still there with, uh, with the fat saw, and I like that. I like it, make it sound a bit ASMR in a way. <laughs> so I like that. Then the bass, to be honest, I think uh, what I did on the bass here, I will probably uh, bypass it because I think the bass is fine by itself. I had an EQ here, but I added it on the computer that doesn't have this EQ, the Crave. So I had to do something else. I tried a few stuff, as you can see. In the end, I kept the century and the culture vulture. I will let you listen to how it sounds. Yeah, I make it the bass a little bit bigger in, in solo. In context, it's not that obvious. I will show you, actually. Yeah, in the end, I think it works. Anyway, I'll show you what I did and explain what I did for the placement of it. I boosted the lows and the mids. The mids is also very important here. I think it sounds very nice. I will show you how it sounds, the mids actually. If I can find the initial position, I'm not sure I can do that anyway. It's not a problem. It's just music, not surgery anyway. Yeah, I like this mids. I like how it makes the bass stand out. I will let you listen to it. That's cool. I like that mid-range 400, kind of 300, 400. I do not need it to boost the high, uh, higher range, like 800 too much here. But I will probably do it in the end when I will add everything and add the reverbs and stuff. We'll probably need that, but I will see. Then, oh yeah, sorry. On this one, I also used the... Preamp in line mode, it's not really like, didn't really care actually. I just wanted to use the EQ because I like the low end on this one, which is pretty big. I will show it to you now actually. Yeah, it's big. can actually get away with more of that. But I will let it here, and I use also a little bit of the compression, but not that much actually, it's just for controlling the peaks, because when you boost the lows in the bass, sometimes it creates some um, notches that just stand out, like some notes goes do 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 
like super loud and uh, you end up fighting your own decision because you end up adding dynamic EQ and compression and everything and it makes it's a mess. That's why some engineers, I think Crystal Dalgi or whoever I can remember, said that they rarely boost the lows in the bass but boost the highs instead. And it makes sense to me if the bass is well recorded. And talking about recording of the bass here, it was recorded without any preamplifier. It was recorded by going from one compressor to the other and EQ to another. I wanted to try that. That's why there is that very sharp high-end sound. Back in the top. It's because it's going from all these tube uh, compressors and EQ that I used. Everything that I did here is showcased on my Instagram. If you have time to lose on social media, you can watch my Instagram and see the actual chain that I used to record this bass. Even if actually I would not advise anyone to do that, it's better to use a proper DI. You can have fun and experiment. That's how you discover stuff. Talking about placement, because that's the whole point of this video. This mid-range knob here, I also cut in a little bit of the highs to tame the, the sound of the high end. That's annoying. But the mid range is how you place the bass properly according to the vocal that is me very low. So the century uh, channel strip here, I mean, more like the choices that are made with the EQ helps the bass to find its own space. Me, me. They make it sound lower. And so I will. By that, by having more lows and more mid lows, I will be able to keep the nice mids for the vocals, actually, which is going to be in the center. Or maybe this guitar also can have it. Because this guitar has a little bit of mean range on me that are that kind of like it. it. What I'm saying is that you don't need to carve space for everything. It's not because that guitar here had a little bit of a mid-range that the bass also have that it's a problem not at all actually i really like mixes where they're all cohesive and i think that cohesiveness doesn't come from plugins does it come from glue compression or any magical saturation you will put like this is in my opinion marketing but cohesiveness comes from most of the time effects and stuff like reverb but also the fact that some instrument shares a little bit of the frequencies together and so they don't sound that separated they sound together, like a lot of layers in the lows and stuff like that. And that's what makes a big, like massive and hug low end, you know, like a nice carpet, fluffy carpet. Anyway, I'm getting a bit carried away. Let's go back to the bass. I use the culture mature again. I know this one. I like it. Mid range saturation. That's what I want on the bass. Yeah, I really like how it pushed almost the transient. It makes no sense what I'm saying, but it pushed the mid range in a way that is quite subtle because it's blended in the parallel, but it make it sound more bouncy in a way. It's hard to explain, but I could have added mid range with EQ, but actually that's not what I wanted. I would wanted to give the feeling that there is more mid range because the original bass has quite a nice amount of mids. And I like that. And I would probably actually in the mix end up doing something like, yeah, this. I like the API EQ. We got one here, API 50, 550B. I really like that EQ. And I would probably use an EQ like the API, which is sharp and quite broad boost with proportional Q push the mids a little bit on the bass. To finish the vi this video, instead of doing another A-B comparison, because it doesn't matter, that's not what matters, I will talk about the mindset a little bit, why these choices and why it's important more than any plugins I could use. The way, like for instance, on the, like the guitar, the rhythm guitar, The processing made them brighter and the shaker in its original form had exactly like it was taking the brightness of the guitar and make it made it annoying, you know what I mean? Because it, it made it spike like tick, 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 
like a like an annoying nag that comes every time. It's not what I wanted. I wanted the shaker to be more like comforting, moving, you know, like a, a small, slow dance in a way. And for that, that's why I use that processing to make it lower. And I will show you the difference, how it gives more, it will give more space to the acoustic guitar in the high end to shine. And at the same time, it will, it will take the groove in the lower register, which is better in my opinion. You see, make it sound like like a proper shaker, actually. A shaker I could like, a shaker that was recorded on a nice preamp with a nice mic, nicely saturated. I really like that sound. And it's the same with the tambourine, the way it used the reverb to put it in the back, as I said earlier. And what's interesting in the all that's all about the placement now that the shaker is going to be more in the back like a bed in a way and the tambourine is going to be pushed back again with the reverb hear how the guitars shine more actually they sound better because of that processing made here in my opinion at least It's almost like the guitar are pushed a little bit forward. It's because the other two elements are pushed in the back. So it gives you the feeling that the other elements are pushed forward in comparison because we're only checking at the moment two elements. But that's one of the ways to create placement in the mix. It's not, again, it's not compression with like glue compression or whatever. That's a term that's used a lot. And I understand that actually why it's used a lot by plugin manufacturers, plugin developers, or even hardware actually uh, manufacturers, because they want to sell their products. It makes sense. So they use the glue thing. So it's like you put this compressor on your mix purse and bam, everything bam. comes cohesive and it's nice and it's soft and it's cool. Or it's aggressive and punchy. It creates a front to back depth or whatever depth, one punch and all the buzzwords. But actually, what make that sense of depth of field, if we can say, because it's there is no depth of field, it's still stereo and we can't fool ourselves. It's just us not being able to describe what's happening properly because our brain can get tricked like that. Like when you uh, listen to a uh, Apple Space Audio or all the stuff or binaural stuff with headphones, it's most of the time it's EQ and delay trick. And here's the same. It's EQ trick, it's saturation trick, everything to trick your brain into thinking that the mix has a 3D feeling to it, whereas it's just stereo. That's our job as mixing engineer, to trick the brains. Anyway, I hope you liked it, I hope it helped you in your own mix and inspire you at least to try new stuff and don't get caught in the marketing hype of compression and saturation just to make glue and cohesiveness and stuff like that no it's decisions it's not saturation it's not compression even it's what i use here it's not that it's not eq it's the decision so yeah have fun and au revoir